Hi guys, just a quick insert here before we get a ranting. It's winter solstice this weekend, which means the Edinburgh winter solstice walk is happening this Sunday. Details on screen and down below. Please come and join me after this vlog. You'll see that we have a lot to rant about. Have a good old moan together. Bring your walking shoes and whiskey goggles. Don't know if you've heard, but linked below is a, I would say disturbing article about the Discovery Channel. Basically to kind of summarize, Discovery are taking away the ability for composers to earn any royalties for stuff on their channel. What is particularly disturbing, I would say nay, onerous, is they want to make this retrogressive. Is that the right word? It certainly feels like the one. They basically want to renegotiate all the contracts done up to date and remove people's rights to earn royalties. What makes it egregious is that they are threatening that if anyone doesn't re-sign these contracts that they will remove their music from the programme and replace it with library music. <laughs> How little respect they have for what it is we do. So what you are doing, Discovery, is solely for the purpose of money. And I think you're going to fail. I don't mean fail in kind of getting composers to work for hire. No, you may succeed there, but I feel that you will eventually fail as a business because you do not care about your viewers. You do not care about your content. Music enhances what it is you do, whether you like it or not. It can amp up the emotion of a scene. It can make something feel bigger than it is. It can tell your audience where they are and when they are. It can make them scared, even if there is nothing on screen to suggest there is any peril. It can give a sense of context and consequence. It can make you understand what will happen in the future and what has happened in the past. It can make you understand what people are thinking, what their motivations are, without them being present at all on screen. Yes, it is a dark art, but it is an art. There's this view that we, in fact, the general masses are a bit stupid, don't appreciate good art when we see it, and can really, we only have a kind of a, a sense of attention for a roughly kind of eight to 10 minutes. Well, the proof is in the pudding. And oh, how many puddings have been made since then. From HBO Sopranos to what we're currently seeing with Netflix. And I know some of you are probably going, oh, Netflix, oh, don't get me started on them either. I was speaking to Nathan Barr, linked above and below, about his feelings about uh, Netflix and their particular business model and stuff. And he said, well, you know, they're starting to understand the, the value of it and that you can't just simply import a royalty model uh, from TV onto a streaming service. Conversely, you know, you only need to look at a new tech like computer games, relatively new. Um, they understood that from the outset. We do not and cannot offer royalties. So we'll give the composers a shit fuck ton of money up front. You are betraying your viewers. You are betraying your content, your producers and your directors because I can tell you, I have never in 20 years of working in the industry, I've never met a producer, an executive producer and a director who didn't give a shit about music. So you will fail. What you are doing, Discovery, is a betrayal not just to the composers, but to your content. The people who have committed time to make that content, from the directors to the dubbing engineers. You are betraying your viewers, most of all, and they will turn their backs on you and walk away. It is so ridiculously short-sighted. You also have to understand that this is a long tradition. Basically, what we do is we start this extraordinary business when we're about five, six years old. We start learning the piano, we're playing the violin, studying theory. It is an enormous investment that we make in our businesses. Then we have to, these days, set up our own facility so that we can give you broadcast quality stuff in no time at all. We have to maintain these and personnel to help us do these things. And I know of very few composers who make a profit on fees up front. We rely wholeheartedly on royalties. And to remove this is to potentially remove the choice you have 
in getting professional help with the enhancement of your content. I mean, come on, you are part of our lives. You yourselves have proven that we have an appetite beyond Noel Edmonds and Mr. Blobby. You yourselves have proven that we have a hunger and a lust for knowledge and to experience and to find out new things and go to new places. Music is at many times more than one third of the sonic output of your platform. Why would you want to betray it? Why would you want to be so cunty towards us that you would get a black mark against your name? I'm not saying this is a threat. This will happen. People will not want to work with you. One, on principle, and two, because they can't afford to, and three, because they can't trust you. So you will then work with a bunch of people who are quite happy to not attach any value to the work they do and will do anything you say. Is that who you really want to collaborate with? So it's discovery. I urge you to reconsider. And for the sake of the profession that is media, film, TV, games, composition, I urge other businesses to be very, very wary of the impact they will have of simply removing our ability to earn money out of this. But because discovery will fail if they continue along this tack, I am full of hope. People's love of good music is not some kind of luxury item. It is a basic human need. We respond to the good shit. You know, when Cool and the Gang comes on the dance floor, people get up and dance to it because it's a great fucking dance track. And good music is something that comes from the heart. It's from the soul. And as a consequence, good music will always be human music. But the other problem is we are part of the problem. By enabling this kind of lunacy, by working for hire, working for free, all you are doing is devaluing you and your work and us and our work. No one is going to value us on our behalf, so it is down to us to value ourselves. Story. I was offered a TV series called Two Pints of Lager and a, pack and a Packet of Crisps. There was no coercion here. It was all cool. I had an upfront fee that was reasonable. I was really young and starving. And they said, listen, uh, we've got this pub publishing company. Would you care for them to publish? They can offer you an advance. The advance was £1,000 and maybe $1,400 at a good exchange. I didn't particularly think this uh, series, it, it was kind of quirky. It was a kind of teenage thing. I didn't think it particularly had legs. It ran for 10 years and over 100 episodes, and it's repeated time and time and time again. And based on the royalties that I currently get, which is 50% of what I could have got if I'd just registered it myself, that has cost me £100,000. You know, if I could offer my advice to my younger self when I accepted that thousand quid advance for my publishing, I would have simply said, Christian, you need a thousand quid that much? Go out and find, do some drum programming for someone. Find out some other way of earning that money. What entrepreneur would, when struggling to set up their business, give away shares to that business because they needed a bit of beer money? It's absolutely absurd. And I think that should be the attitude when confronted with these problematic choices of going, well, am I going to invest in my own business to just simply give it away? Because your business, as currently things work out with composition, will be your portfolio of royalties. The big breaks you think are going to be big breaks, you'll be surprised they may not be. And believe you me, you are brilliant. You will get work. If you turn it down, you are putting a value on yourself. You can't have this for free. Trust me, your first job opportunity will not be your last. Don't make it one that exploits what it is you do. And again, from someone who's been in this industry for a long time. All of my best work, all of my best jobs have come out of me saying no. Show them a little bit of ankle and then go, mm -mm, mm -mm, not gonna have me, not gonna have these ankles. And believe you me, they will come knocking. Well, what's he got? Why is she charging a thousand dollars a minute for computer games music? Why is he insisting that he retains his rights? Well, there must be something special about him. You know, our industry is a narcissistic one, and there's nothing that will devalue you more to a narcissist than capitulation. What I think is particularly interesting about the Discovery's threat is I think it's inactionable, but I also think it's a bit of a double bluff, because if you say no to them retrospectively taking your rights to earn royalties in the future for your works away, 
by threatening to take your music off the projects, which aren't going to earn you money anyway, then what possible incentive, other than we won't give you any work in the future, do you have to agree to such ridiculousness? Also, we know <laughs> that it isn't just about putting drones and beds underneath stuff. I just think it would just be wonderful if everyone just went, okay, just let's just remove all of our scores. As I say, I would be losing sleep at night if I just didn't think it was absolutely ridiculous. And I think what this is amounting to is coercion, and I think at the very least, a legal restriction of trade. So moving forward, I would say to the discovery composers, say no. And I would really, really think seriously. And it's not just about looking after the, I'm not a granddad, but the dads like me who have, you know, it's all right for you, you've got your house and all of this kind of stuff. It's not about looking up at us. It's about looking after your futures. You are building a portfolio of royalties. And if that portfolio is empty, you will not earn any money ever. Now, there is also something I want to read to you. And this is something that I feel is really, really important for us to consider. There was a self-help book in the, I think it was out in the late 90s, called Who Moved My Cheese? by a gentleman called uh, Spencer Johnson. Allegorically, Who Moved My Cheese? features four characters, two mice, Sniff and Scurry, and two little people, Hem and Haw. They live in a maze, a representation of one's environment, and look for cheese, representative of happiness and success. Initially without cheese, each group, the mice and humans, paired off and travelled the lengthy corridors searching for cheese. One day both groups happened upon a cheese-filled corridor at Cheese Station C. Content with their find, the humans established routines around their daily intake of cheese, slowly becoming arrogant in the process. One day Sniff and Scurry arrive at Cheese Station C to find no cheese left, but they are not surprised, noticing that the cheese supply had been dwindling. They have mentally prepared beforehand for the arduous but inevitable task of finding more cheese. Leaving Cheese Station C behind, they begin their hunt for new cheese together. Later that day, Hem and Haw arrive at Cheese Station C, only to find the same thing, no cheese. Angered and annoyed, Hem demands, who moved my cheese? The humans have counted on this cheese supply to be constant, and they are so unprepared for this eventuality. After deciding that the cheese is indeed gone, they get angry at the unfairness of the situation. Haw suggests a search for new cheese, but Hem is dead set in his disappointment and dismisses this proposal. Meanwhile, Sniff and Scurry have found Cheese Station N and new cheese, but back at Cheese Station C, Hem and Haw are affected by their lack of cheese and blame each other for their problem. Hoping to change, Haw again proposes to search for new cheese. However, Hem is comforted by his old routine and is frightened about the unknown. He knocks the idea again. After a while of being in denial, the humans remain without cheese. One day, having discovered his debilitating fears, Haw begins to chuckle at the situation and stops taking himself so seriously, realising he should simply move on. Haw enters the maze, but not before chiselling, if you do not change, you can become extinct on the wall of Cheese Station C. It goes on, and I've linked to, this is just the Wikipedia kind of uh, synopsis. We've all experienced, possibly with people who are senior and elder to us within the music industry, this conservatism. You know, if people want to earn money out of YouTube, why don't they set up fucking YouTube channels and then, you know, you can sell merchandise and ad revenue and all that kind of stuff. And people said, well, I didn't, didn't learn to play the piano to sell t-shirts and mugs. It's like saying, well, I didn't set up a cinema to earn money from selling popcorn. I personally, I may be wrong in saying this, but I think it is boom time for the music industry. Is it getting through to the artists? I think that that is a concern. But there are artists who are making seminal amounts of money. I believe someone said it was 6.1 billion quid went to the Exchequer for the music industry alone just in the UK. An extraordinary amount of money for people just screaming into SM58. In the history of making music professionally or otherwise has never been a particularly financially rewarding one, whether it be your violinists in the court of King so-and-so, the what's-it, or indeed travelling troubadours. We've always struggled, we've always suffered for our art, and indeed in the 20th century there were these very few people who made shed tons of money. But I always go back to someone like Led Zeppelin, who are maybe, I think, the pinnacle of success and excess that we've ever witnessed. And the fundamental thing that they did was take merchandising rights away from the venues and made their own merchandise. George Lucas is another fine example of someone who earned his money, who financed his business from selling toys. If the value does disappear from our industry, our only hope is to make stuff of inherent value. That is, 
excellent music. We know that humans love excellent music beautifully played on interesting instruments. We know that AI will never beat humans at music because AI could never invent rap. Let's keep things moving on and let's not write music that computers could write. Let's not score things like it's just a bubbling bed and a drone, even if that's what they want. Let's try and push it forward. You only need to look at the Netflix production of Chernobyl to hear a score that is totally extraordinary. Check out 1917 this year. You know, Thomas Newman isn't treading water. He's pushing things forward. Hans Zimmer is a great example of a man who is pushing the idiom forward, who is retaining his worth by basically achieving the untouchable. What we need to do has to be great. So I, I do genuinely not have fear. I think it's probably not helpful for us to say that this will kill our industry. When it's like, are we just going to let them do that? Are we just going to become victims to this? It is our responsibility to make our industry thrive, to help each other and encourage each other to make something that it is, is of value and to encourage ourselves to value it ourselves. I am talking around in circles, but I do have hope. But again, remember the allegory of where's my cheese? It is out there somewhere. It just might not be in a self-sealed brown paper envelope with a second class stamp on it. The times, they are a changing and we have to change with the times. We need to be ahead of the curve, not always behind it. Our suspicion towards technology, towards new outlets, towards new broadcasters has meant that we're always playing catch up. We have to look ahead. I hope this has been a satisfactory rant and I didn't have time this morning to construct a rant cape, but I will do in the future. In fact, I've bumped into a few of you in person recently and um, you have said that my vlog has been particularly rant free of late. So it was good to get it off my chest. Listen, I've just, everyone take care of yourself. You're worth more than this. So stick up for yourself. And I promise you, if you say no, good will come out of it. Thanks as always for watching. Subscribe if you haven't done already. Please contribute in the comments down below. Ding the bell if you want to be notified the next time I put a video up. And one of those for all of the fucking brilliant composers who have written music for Discovery Channel, for the commitment they have given that platform, for the enhancement to that content they've given. Good on you. Stand by your guns.